I'm Gordon Stewart, and this is episode 7 of Tales from Weird Scotland. Listeners are advised that this episode includes some content and language which they may find uncomfortable, reflecting attitudes and practices of earlier times. No offence or distress is intended, but some of the content may be unsuitable, especially for younger listeners. Parental guidance is advised. This is a safe place for all, and we submit this episode with respect for all. The month of February marks LGBT History Month in Scotland, and in other countries, and so we're taking a short detour away from our more usual supernatural or weird history to present a short LGBT history of Scotland. There are very few references to LGBT people, as we would know them today, or same-sex activity, in Scotland before the 1700s, but of course they were always there. There are one or two famous, or even infamous, supposed LGBT people from Scotland's past. Like the second husband of Mary, Queen of Scots, Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley. Described at the time by gossips in the Scottish Royal Court as a great cock chick, whatever that means, or the slightly more obscure polished trifler. But these types of quotes are notable for their rarity. Darnley's an interesting one, rumoured to be, as perhaps we would now say, bisexual or pansexual even. This was said to be something that was fashionable. At the French royal court at the time, it was said, perhaps, with a bit of a smirk. One courtier lamented Queen Mary's choice of Darnley as husband, saying, No woman of spirit would make choice of such a man that was more woman than man, for he was very lusty, beardless, and lady-faced. Perhaps all this infers was that he was simply immature, or maybe not the familiar hard man of Scottish culture we've become accustomed to. His behaviour undoubtedly lacked maturity, or common sense at any rate, but perhaps his sexuality did play a part in his downfall too, which ended in his mysterious murder at the age of just 21. Found strangled and semi-naked next to one of his manservants, lying in the garden of a small house he was recuperating in after an illness, the house itself blown up with gunpowder. The murky episode around his suspicious death, and the supposed involvement or lack of by his wife Mary, is still debated today. Mary and Darnley's son, Prince James, would grow up after his mother's exile and execution to become King James VI of Scots, Scotland's own royal demonologist and hammer of the witches. When Elizabeth Tudor of England died without children, James inherited Elizabeth's throne and moved the royal court from Scotland ruling from afar. Sir Walter Raleigh, speaking in England of the 1603 ascension of James as King James I of England, is said to have remarked, King Elizabeth has been replaced by Queen James. This quote may or may not be true. James VI, or I, may or may not have been bisexual in our modern eyes. But what is certain is that he did have very strong feelings for his male favourites, especially George Villiers, whom he would elevate to the highest rank of the nobility as the first Duke of Buckingham. 
Many letters between the two men exist, expressing love for each other. But this should be treated with some caution, and may simply reflect a different style of male behaviour of that time, rather than fit any LGBT narrative retrofitted by us. Of legal cases, where same-sex activity as such is mentioned, the crimes seem to be sensational rather than commonplace. In Edinburgh, in September 1570, John Swan and John Litzer were convicted of the wild, filthy, detestable and unnatural sin of sodomy, otherwise named buggery, abusing of their bodies with others, in contrary the laws of God and all other human laws. They were strangled at the stake, and their bodies cast into a fire and burned to ashes. The same punishment doled out to so-called witches. There would be no Christian burial then, so no chance of redemption. Indeed, sodomy was heavily associated with diabolical actions, witchcraft accusations, a pact with the devil, if indeed it was mentioned at all. Same-sex desire as a concept really didn't exist or have a name if it was considered by anyone at all. Only in the era of Oscar Wilde's trial did a concept of homosexuality become widespread, although that word was a little bit in the future waiting. In Scotland, there were no sensational cases in the courts unlike in England. Instead, we see a gradual rise in the number of minor court cases involving male-to-male -male sexual acts. There's virtually no mention of lesbians, let alone bisexuals, in Scotland's historic story. And the T doesn't arrive to join the L, G and B for quite some time to come either. And so these lives remained hidden, although of course they were always there. Secret. Banished. Following the 1707 Act of Union, when the kingdoms of Scotland and England were merged to form the new single Kingdom of Great Britain, the old Parliament of Scotland was closed. The General Assembly of the Church of Scotland became the centre of political and social discourse in Scotland. It's been likened to a Parliament by proxy. Here, Godly doctrine was upheld, and it's fair to say that the Calvinist principles of the 1560 Reformation were very much alive and kicking until well into the 20th century. And this was reflected in society and how people were treated by society. The Edinburgh of the 1700s was a place of great uncertainty and rapid change. Seven years into the century, Scotland disappeared as a country, absorbed into Britain, one kingdom with one parliament and one monarch, Queen Anne, the last of the House of Stuart, and possibly the most famous lesbian in British history. When as Queen Anne of great renown, Great Britain's sceptre swayed, Besides the church, she clearly loved a dirty chambermaid, said one little ditty. Queen Anne's older sister Mary II had, with her husband William of Orange, overthrown her father, King James VII, in 1688, the so-called Glorious Revolution, taking the throne for the Protestant faith and forcing the Catholic Stuarts into exile as the Jacobites. William of Orange, the poster boy in Europe for the wars against the Catholic powers, has for a very long time had accusations of being gay used against him. Like Darnley and James VI, however, 
This may be little more than an attempt to smear him or damage his reputation by his enemies. A poem, published some time after in 1750, recalls the exiled King James VII and the usurping new King William. James was but ill-deposed, whose fruitful cods scattered a generous race of demigods, while t'other unperforming puny prig could only with his page retire and frig. Mass-produced chapbooks, titillated, gossiped and surmised on the comings and goings of high society. The rich language and slang of this period shows a growing subculture emerge. Male sex workers providing services for men could be found in several brothels. Known as mollies, they worked in molly houses, whilst their lesbian counterparts were tommies. Other terms used at the time to describe such men included the ubiquitous sodomites, those who navigate the windward passage, madges, and backgammon players. This earthy colour gives us an insight into queer life in the 18th century, almost in a sense similar to the polari of the 20th century. Secretive terms for those in the know, trying to stay outside of the reach of the law. Other charming terms that would emerge into the 20th century include Bufty, a name seemingly uniquely Scottish, Pansy, Sissy, Uphill Gardener, and someone who's a bit light in the fedora. The explosion of ideas, scientific discoveries, medical advancement and the flourishing arts and culture we now know as the Enlightenment of the 18th century had its heart in Edinburgh. The city of Adam Smith, Jane Porter, Mary Fairfax Somerville. They were all concerned with science, with reason, liberty and experimentation. The French writer-philosopher Voltaire famously stated, We look to Scotland for all our ideas of civilization." Part of the culture of Edinburgh and elsewhere were the growing clubs that existed. Some were scientific, some literary or historical, some were quite simply more earthy. Many were simple drinking dens, and some focused on libertine ideas, but normally these were for men only. The clubs were, significantly, made up of a wide range of men from across a wider social stratum that you may have expected, including aristocracy, gentry, merchants and clergy, and many were politically radical at heart. Perhaps the most notorious in Scotland were the Beggar's Benison and the Wig Club. The Beggar's Benison was founded in the small borough of Ainster or Anstruther in Fife in 1731 and was an all-male affair. With the motto, May prick nor purse ne'er fail ye, this club celebrated bawdy ballads drinking games involving phallus-shaped cups, and an interesting initiation ceremony involving a tree. This was not an early gay society though, it was simply body, like a rugby club but with powdered wigs, phallic drinking cups and the platter on which they apparently contributed their own essence have survived. Some of their badges Sashes and ceremonies can be seen to have obviously mocked Freemasonry, and some of their members were also notable for their Jacobitism and profound anti-union position. 
later branches formed in Edinburgh, Glasgow and as far away as St. Petersburg in Russia. Forward thinking in many ways, with a focus on common sense, freedom of sexuality and attempts to stop a rise in social conservatism were included in their writings. There were also very strong links with smuggling and opposition to the perceived, at least, stranglehold of new English customs and excise rules following the 1707 Union. In the aftermath of the atrocities of the Battle of Culloden in 1746, the radical elements of the club would seem to diminish in favour of the sensual, and by 1783 the Hanoverian Prince Regent, no less, had become an honorary member. The beggar's benison would last about a century in total, with an early 20th century attempt at revival being unsuccessful. The Wick Club was a splinter group, which resulted after a schism in 1775. Taking its name from a wig said to have been woven from the pubic hair of the mistresses of King Charles II, this club was perhaps formed as a reaction to the lack of social segregation of the beggar's benison. The new club was very much for the elite of society and was recorded as meeting on occasion at the coffee house of the new Royal Exchange Building on Edinburgh's Royal Mile, now the City Chambers. It's interesting though that the idea of safe places, whether clubs or meeting houses, would ring true in the centuries that followed. There were heightened concerns over dance halls in Scotland during the interwar period. These were linked to fears of growing immorality. Several cases were brought during this period over the use of female dance partners who could be hired for an evening, most notably a case involving immoral earnings at the Cosmo Club during the 1930s. As the stranglehold of Victorian and Edwardian morality began to fade, more conservative elements in society were concerned about a perceived breakdown between gender conformity and sexuality. Another scandal involved Maxime's Palais de Dance in West Hole Cross in Edinburgh, which opened in November 1921. Maxime's was to attract police involvement when it was found to be offering private leisure activities to men, which involved soldiers stationed at a local barracks. In 1958, the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland overwhelmingly rejected the recommendations of the Wolfenden Report, which helped begin the move to the partial decriminalisation of male homosexuality in England and Wales in 1967. The Wolfenden Report recommended to Parliament the decriminalisation of male homosexuality in private between consenting adults over 21. Scotland would have to wait until 1980 to follow suit. Also in 1958, the Lord Chamberlain's office lifted the ban on reference to homosexuality on stage. An interesting footnote in the history of LGBT drama can be traced back to Edinburgh. In 1934, Lillian Hellman wrote a play that would become infamous at the time. A smash hit on Broadway, but banned in the United Kingdom. The Children's Hour tells the story of two women teachers accused of an affair by one of their pupils. A film was made of the play in 1961, starring Audrey Hepburn, Shirley MacLaine, and James Gardner. What's less well known is that the events the film and play are based on took place in Edinburgh 
as far back as 1809. Jane Perry and Marianne Woods opened a school for girls in Drumshuch Place, Edinburgh, one of the many private schools that catered to the very wealthy gentry of Edinburgh's Georgian Newtown. One of their pupils accused the two of inordinate affection. Her mother, a Charlotte Square grand dame, spread the rumour and soon all of their pupils had left. The teachers sued and won the case, but were ruined. The lurid accusations by their pupil was enough to destroy their careers. One of the judges hearing the case, Lord Meadowbank, however, was less convinced. Sex between women, he said, was equally imaginary with witchcraft, sorcery, or carnal copulation with the devil. Not an unusual thought in early 19th century Scotland. Sexual attraction between women was inconceivable to most. Little wonder then that the lives of lesbian or bisexual women in previous centuries lay undocumented. And so too issues of gender identity. The University of Edinburgh has long been held as a centre of excellence for medical studies. From 1809 to 1812, one of the students there stood out among the rest. Considered to be a bad-tempered, squeaky-voiced eccentric, this doctor would rise to have a distinguished career in South Africa, the Caribbean and St Helena, rising to become the Inspector General of Military Hospitals. Hated by Florence Nightingale for his temper and supposed treatment of staff, Dr. James Barry's reputation as a bully perhaps stemmed from the bullying he himself received from his tormentors when he was younger, due to his apparent youthful, somewhat prepubescent appearance. His staff may or may not have hated his brusque manner, but he was a skilled surgeon with a focus on improving sanitation and health. And, on his death from dysentery in 1865, he was discovered to have been a woman. When news of this broke, claims that James was a hermaphrodite, or perhaps intersex to use the more modern term, were raised. The army, seemingly in something of a panic, sealed all records about him for almost 100 years, only opening them again in the 1950s. And only then did the strange background and story of James Barry begin to emerge. Born as Margaret Anne Buckley in Ireland and linked to Venezuelan political radicals and the artist James Barry, it may well have been their plan to study medicine as a man and move to Venezuela practicing medicine as a woman, something unthinkable in Britain at that time and for another half century to come. That plan failed, and for whatever reason, Margaret Anne, or James, joined the army as a physician. But on James's death, the woman who made the astonishing discovery claimed that he was a perfect woman with signs of having given birth when younger. Barry's last wishes, seemingly, had been to be buried in the clothes he died in without his body being prepared. And maybe this was why. Or maybe, like so much else in the story of Barry's life, it's simply not true, and myths obscure the facts. A committed social reformer, teetotaler and vegetarian, in many ways years ahead of his time. He performed caesarean sections long before these became commonplace. Was he intersex? 
Was his life as James based on sexuality, or simply the burning desire to be a doctor? We can't tell, and we should be aware of trying again to retrofit modern terms on the past. Back in Scotland, society was changing slowly, politically and socially. In the 1980s and 1990s, in Edinburgh, certain venues occupy a significant place in the LGBT history of the city. The Laughing Duck pub, the Fire Island and Blue Oyster nightclubs, for example. From 1982 until 1990, the pioneering LGB bookshop Lavender Menace on 4th Street and then the later West and Wild bookshop on Dundas Street provided alternative literary beacons for LGBT people. The Fire Island nightclub was launched in what was the West End Club in Edinburgh's Princess Street on a Monday night in May 1978. The impact of this place can't be overlooked. The first LGBT nightclub in Scotland to regularly feature big name recording artists, including Eartha Kitt and the village people. Eventually though, the owner of the building that the club was in sold the valuable premises and it's now a Waterstones bookshop. The nightclub closed in September 1988. The last record that was played at Fire Island was the ABBA song. Thank you for the music. The re-establishment of a parliament in Scotland in 1999 was another sign of things to come. One of the first acts of the fledgling parliament was to overturn the UK Parliament's 1988 Local Government Act, Clause 28 or Section 2A, as it's infamously remembered in Scotland. This was passed in the height of the AIDS hysteria affecting the country and effectively banned the promotion or mention of homosexuality by local authorities, especially in schools. The demonising of the disease in the media and the association of HIV and AIDS with gay and bisexual men worsened their stigmatisation and assisted in the rise of higher levels of prejudice and hate crimes. In 1987, according to the British Social Attitude Survey, 75% of the population said that homosexual activity was always or mostly wrong. One English MP said, I do not agree with homosexuality. I think that Clause 28 will help outlaw it and the rest will be done by AIDS, with a substantial number of homosexuals dying of AIDS. I think that's probably the best way. Views like his were not that unusual, if not so extreme. In 1999, the US TV evangelist Pat Robertson described Scotland as a dark land overrun by homosexuals. While in May of that year, the gay Admiral Duncan pub in London was bombed by a right-wing extremist. Three people were killed and over 70 injured. And it was in this anti-gay hostile environment that the new Scottish Parliament met for the first time and media attention focused on the new devolved legislature, beginning in Edinburgh. A ferocious Keep the Clause campaign, with support from the Daily Record newspaper, fanned a very bitter debate. Despite the hostilities, however, the new Scottish Parliament repealed the legislation in the year 2000. The rest of the UK followed suit in 2003. By the end of the century, Scotland was acknowledged as one of the most progressive countries for LGBT rights in the world. Much has changed here since John Swan and John Litster were burnt at the stake in front of Edinburgh Castle 
451 years ago. But in these very uncertain times, where untruths, right-wing populism and everyday hate crimes encroach on the freedoms that have been tirelessly fought for by those who went before us, let us reflect that nothing can be taken for granted. Until next time, stay safe, stay well, and join us for more tales of the strange and supernatural, more tales of weird Scotland. Good night, and thank you. Oikiva, and tak pa leif, chiri andrasta. That was Gordon Stewart. Check out his blog at borderlandscotland.wordpress.com. This episode was written by Gordon Stewart. It was produced and radiophonically designed by me, Nick Cole Hamilton. Regular listeners will be aware that this episode is somewhat different in form and content from previous episodes. Usually, we like to employ our own sounds and compositions. However, for this episode, it felt appropriate to source music which reflected the time periods being spoken about, and to generally avoid emotive or creepy sound effects. So, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the pieces of music used and their performance. Just before I do though, I'd like to say that as far as was possible, we've tried to use music from the public domain or which permits reuse. If we've erred here, please let us know and we will be more than happy to make appropriate changes. This episode featured Masculine Women, Feminine Men, written by Jimmy Monaco and Edgar Leslie, performed by Frank Harris, aka Irving Kaufman. It featured multiple early and Renaissance classical guitar pieces by John Sayles. We've included a link to his repository in the description. It really is amazing the collection he's put together. There were selections from Sonata of Scots Tunes by James Oswald, performed by Concerto Caledonia and David McGuinness. It featured Love, Your Spell is Everywhere, performed by Ben Selvin and his orchestra, and also Drink to Me Only with Thine Eyes by Alfred Newman and his orchestra. And finally, it featured Sun Disco by Cow and Lake, of which Andrew Cowan, who designed the Tales from Weird Scotland logo, was Cow and I was Lake. This is a You Better Run Media production. Join us again soon for more Tales from Weird Scotland.